And Dr. Reardon is a world-renowned uh, public, uh, he's the uh, national PI on, on several uh, papers and several, uh, he's really uh, pushed the envelope on uh, teaching us when TAVR should be done and, and uh, now he'll teach you. So, Dr. Reardon. Well, thank you, Ross. If you really want to know the truth about me, just call my wife, she'll tell you all that's nonsense. Yeah, but and my standard disclosure is yes, I have run a lot of the trials, but we're really not going to talk about valves types today. When I thought about this talk, I thought I could do two things. One is I could show you a bunch of valves and how they're put in, and a bunch of pretty pictures. That's always fun and exciting. You guys don't need that. What I, th I thought would be better for you is to understand the, the evidence that's out there, so why this is important. So there are two extreme risk trials that were run in this country. In the upper left, if I can get the, the mouse working, is the one that was done for the sapien balloon expandable trial, randomized against best medical therapy. It's interesting because there's never been a randomized trial between surgical AVR and medical therapy ever. And so this is some of the best data we have. And there was a 20% survival advantage at every year out to five years. When we ran the core valve trial, which I designed, we wanted to randomize against medical therapy, but partner had already come out, so that was no longer ethical. So we actually had a performance goal, which was the 95% lower uh, mortality level of partner plus five contemporary balloon aortic valvuloplasty trials. And we beat that goal handily. In fact, it's gone out to five years now, and the survival is good. So FDA approved this for people that were not surgical candidates. Then we ran high-risk trials, which were people that were surgical candidates with a presumed surgical mortality of above 10% but still operable. This is the partner trial for the Sapien, and you see at five years there's no difference in survival. In the core valve trial, where we did the same thing with the balloon expandable core valve versus surgery, at one year, there was actually statistically superior survival for TAVR over surgery. It's the first trial where a device had ever beat surgery, ever. And it was statistically superior at two years. By three years, we still had a delta of 6.2% in favor of TAVR, but we'd lost statistical superiority. Five-year-old would be presented at TCT by Tom Gleason. So high risk got approved by FDA. There was a couple things you need to look at in high risk. One in the partner 1A, the stroke rate was twice as high in TAVR as surgery. And so all the surgeons said, well, you know, you've got to operate on people because these TAVRs are stroking them out. That's the only trial that's ever shown that. In the high-risk trial here, although it didn't reach statistical significance, there was less stroke in TAVR than there was surgery numerically, less major adverse cardiovascular and cerebral vascular events, and the forward flow hemodynamics were statistically superior to surgery at every single time point. And every trial that's been run since then, numerically TAVRs had less stroke than surgery. So that's really no longer an issue. One thing we see in all the randomized trials is that surgery always has more life-threatening bleeding and transfusion, more acute kidney injury, and more atrial fibrillation. Every single randomized trial has that. And then TAVR tends to have more major vascular complications. We're using big sheaths and more pacemaker implants. Now, I was a little shocked that, that we lost to uh, TAVR, and so I went back and did an analysis of every single death. I looked at every death in TAVR, every death in surgery, and created this instantaneous hazard risk of death. Zero to 30 days, your procedural risk of death, one to four months, your recovery phase, and the constant phase. And the only time that, ta that, that TAVR was superior was in the recovery phase. And that was because these surgical patients were older, they were 83 years old, they were sicker, they would survive surgery, we'd send them to an LTAC, and a bunch of them just never got better. Then we ran intermediate risk trials, partner 2A, which is now the second generation Sapien XT, and Sertavi, which was 84% first generation core valve and 16% second generation Evolute. The Partner 2 was a randomized trial, and it was stratified by access. The mean age was over 81 years old. The STS predicted risk of mortality is 5.8. And if you look at the primary endpoint, which is all-cause mortality or disabling stroke, there was really no difference at two years. No difference statistically, but numerically less for TAVR. Now, that's important because this is a non-inferiority trial, and you can be non-inferiority, but numerically worse. And if you're non-inferior but numerically worse, that leads to bio creep, so that each trial gets a little further from what the ideal should be. So being non-inferior and numerically less is actually very important. If you looked at just the transfemoral cases and you looked at primary uh, endpoint as mortality and disabling stroke, all of a sudden TAVR was superior in the transfemoral. This wasn't, a, this wasn't powered and it wasn't a pre-planned analysis, so the statisticians will argue about this, but it starts to show you where the trend is going. And if you look at the uh, 30 and two year uh, data, really the only thing that stands out is that the life-threatening and disabling bleeding was more, more common in surgery, acute kidney injury, that kind of phased out a little bit, but still stiff, significant, and atrial fibrillation, but those are all early events. And then major vascular complications for uh, TAVR. 
Statistically, bigger effective orifice areas for TAVR over surgery at all time points for the balloon expandable valve. But there's more perivalvular leak, 8% moderate to severe for this second generation valve. We ran SIRTAVI. This is the trial I ran with, with Jeff Popma. These are randomized people in intermediate risk, 3 to 10% estimated mortality. One of the things that was different about this trial and all the trials we've run is that after Partner 1A, every trial has patients seen by a neurologist to make sure we picked up all the strokes. If you let surgeons look for strokes, we miss over half the strokes. So everybody was seen by a neurologist, and, and, and instead of randomizing by access site like Partner did, we randomized by the need for revascularization. Primary endpoint, all-cause mortality or disabling stroke at 24 months. As I said, this is mainly a first-generation valve, 84%. The second generation was only introduced at the very end, and we in about 16%. 94% of these now being done transfemorally. We did a Bayesian analysis. I'm not going to spend a lot of time because we're way behind. If you guys want to know how Bayesian analysis works, I'm happy to sit down and talk to you. But it allows you to have a look at the data early and predict the two-year endpoint essentially at one year. So by using a Bayesian statistical analysis, I have a two-year endpoint at one year of, of follow-up that allowed me to get this valve on the market a year early and save Medtronic about $80 million. But I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about it. Again, if you're interested in the difference between frequency statistics and Bayesian statistics, come see me at the end. We'll talk about it. It's still an older group of patients. They're still 80 years old, and the STS is less than Partner 2A, but still four and a half. If you look at the all-cause mortality or disabling strokes at two years, Absolutely no difference, numerically a little less in, in TAVR. Again, we like to see it numerically a little bit less. And the way we do Bayesian statistics is we use this to predict a posterior probability curve and a posterior probability uh, Bayesian statistic. And here it was greater than 0.999. So if you guys need p-value of frequency statistics, the way to get that roughly from any Bayesian statistics is to subtract it from one. So the p-value is basically less than 0 0.0001. So when you, when you read Bayesian analysis, and you'll see those in the literature, that's the way to do it. If you look at all-cause mortality, this is really interesting. All-cause mortality, there's no difference at two years between TAVR and SAVR. But look at the 30-day mortality for surgery, 1.7%. Remember, the STS was 4.5%. That gives you an O to E ratio of 0.38. That's the best O to E ratio we've seen in any of the of the trials, that's a tremendously good survival for the surgeons, and yet TAVR still stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with this really good surgery, mortality about one-third of what you would expect. And again, I went back and looked at the instantaneous hazard risk, and this is what you see now. What happens is they start lower, they fall faster, and they just stay down. These are healthier patients, and so they don't have that problem with recovering. So what do you think is going to happen at our low-risk trial? Well, it's pretty easy to predict that. It's going to go a little bit lower and stay a little bit flatter. So the odds of us being non-inferior in our low-risk trial is really, is really uh, pretty high. I went and looked at all the, the randomized trials out there and looked at the uh, one-year mortality and by risk score. And if you see, these top line is surgery, the bottom line is TAVR, and you see they're starting to converge as you go down in risk. Again, it gives you some idea what's going to happen in low risk, which is about 80% of the patients out there, which is why you guys need to know about this. And again, disabling stroke. Numerically less for TAVR. It didn't quite reach statistical significance. Again, when you read Bayesian statistics, look at the 95% confidence interval for difference. If both those were negative, then it would have been superior for, for TAVR. If both of them are positive, it would have been superior for surgery. If one's negative and one's positive, it hasn't made it. But one being that far off, that's like being 0 0.055. It's trending, but it's not quite significant. One thing we know about TAVR is the procedure time's always less. There is no cross clamp. The anesthesia time's less. The ICU time, we, there's an ICU time. We don't send people to ICU anymore. This is all old data. It's very unusual for anybody to go to the ICU, and most people are home in two or three days. So this is pretty old data, where surgery really hasn't changed. If you look at where surgery uh, wins, uh, surgery wins in pacemaker use and, uh, and PVL, TAVR wins in cardiogenic shock, AFib, acute kidney injury, transfusion, and stroke. Transfusion, acute kidney, and atrial fibrillation, all important because they kill you now and they kill you later. Surgeons have got to do a better job. And this is the hemodynamic data I presented at the American College of Cardiology last year, and we published in New England Journal. And what you notice is that it's statistically better. TAVR tends to give single-digit gradients, which is really unusual in surgical valves. But more importantly, look at the EOA, 2.13, 2.15. Keep that in mind. EOAs are really important. We haven't paid attention to them. Everybody gets better in their functional class. Both these relieve aortic stenosis. 
But when you look at the KCCQ, the Kansas City Quantum Opti score, which is a 100 point score, 100 perfect, zero death, five point increase is a small increase, 10 points moderate, 20 point is great. Both these increase 20 points, but TAVR does it much faster at 30 days. By six months, surgery catches up. By one year, they're the same. Now, here's another thing that was really interesting about that. Everybody got a six minute walk test at baseline at one month and one year. And not surprisingly, TAVR did better at one month than surgery, right? Because you're recovering from surgery. You don't expect them to do as well. But if the KCCQ comes up, aren't you recovered by year? Shouldn't the surgery people recover by year? Well, they, they recovered some, but they still were statistically behind TAVR. And some of that may have to do with the hemodynamics. And again, TAVR here, we have 5% moderate to, to severe paravaviral leak. Surgery just had a 1% rate. Again, that we have tended to lose. So both intermediate risk trials are done, and that's actually approved by the FDA. There's a non-randomized S3, which was a, a, the third generation valve. They're still 81 years old. It's still five. The thing to look at here is look at the 30-day mortality now for TAVR. 1.1% and the, and the stroke rate, disabling stroke rate is 1%. One of the things we thought about when we went to low risk is that the low risk trials are going to be the 1% trials for surgery. 1% mortality and 1% stroke. And in this non-randomized intermediate risk group with the third generation balloon expandable, it's pretty close to that. And they went back and they propensity scored it against the surgical arm of the randomized P2A, and they did statistically better. Now, we can have a long argument about whether or not these are valid statistics. Um, you know, it's been going on for a long time, and I tell everybody, ignore the statistics. Just look at those numbers, 1.1% mortality, you know, 1.1% stroke. You know, th th those, are, those are tremendous numbers. It's like the two guys that are riding the donkey in the midday heat and they stop for lunch, and the only shadow is the donkey's shadow. So they start arguing about who gets the shade, and the donkey runs off. Well, if you're arguing about the statistics, as a surgeon, the donkey's going to run off. You've got to pay attention. And if you look at the all-cause mortality, again, the, the S3 did better than surgery. Again, it's not, a, not that big a surprise. And if you look at, at stroke, TAVR did better than surgery. Everything after partner 1A, TAVR has numerically less stroke, every single trial. Now look, moderate severe paravalvular leak rates down to 1.1%, getting closer and closer to surgical valves. Now, the third TAVI I told you was 84% it was, it was first generation valve. We did a continued access where we did 275 patients. Now it's 93% second generation valve. And if you look at it, it's a little bit younger. Instead of being almost 80, it's 79. The STS has now gone from 4.4 to 4.1. But the thing to look at is look at the all cause mortality. All cause mortality at 30 days, 275 patients, 79 years old, 0%. Now, I'm not a great statistician, but it's pretty statistically hard to beat zero. Disabling stroke, 0.4%. So if the low-risk trials are going to be the 1% trials, surgery could be in trouble based on this data. And if you look at the, the um, moderate to severe paravalvular, uh, rate, uh, paravalvular leak rate, 1.1%. Again, starting to look a lot more like a surgical valve. And in fact, I took Sertavi and divided it into the first half of Sertavi, the second half, and the third half, just to see how we were improving. And look at the improvement in mortality in blue and, st and stroke in red. This is better devices and people learning how to do this better. We had a bigger valve added, the Evolute 34. Interesting, we now have single digit gradients that are approaching the number five. We have EOAs of almost two and a half. Those are almost unheard of. And then the third generation was the Pro where we wrapped a pericardial valve, a pericardial skirt around this to help seal it up. When I was helping Medtronic design this, I told them this was a stupid design. Just wrapping pericardium around there wouldn't work. You needed something better. I was wrong. I'm wrong a lot. That's, that being married for 43 years, I've learned to live with being wrong a lot. Uh, and, and the reason is, is that this increases the surface contact by eight times, just putting that wrap on there eight times. You still have really good EOAs with the, with the third generation Pro, but more importantly, look at one year. The green is traced to no paravalvular leak, 90%. The blue is mild, about 10%. There is no moderate or severe. This looks like a surgical valve. This is the competition that we as surgeons are going to have to be dealing with. And the pacemaker rate, which has been a problem with the self-expanding valve, more so than the balloon expandable valve, now down to 11.7%. If you look at meta-analysis of surgical pacemakers, they range between 3 and 11. And if we want to go to low risk, we really need to get to be 10% or less, but we're getting closer and closer to that. So for intermediate risk and low risk, for intermediate risk, if we want to use, think about TAVR versus surgery, you need equivalent or better mortality. We've shown that. Hemodynamics, TAVR is actually better hemodynamics no matter which valve, commercial available valve you, you want to use. Quality of life, quality of life is the same in both. 
patient acceptance, I didn't show any data, but everybody walks in my office wants a TAVR. Nobody wants me to operate on them. Some people come in and say, you know, Dr. Reardon, I've got the internet out, and here's, I've read this article about TAVR, and I have to say, yeah, but you've got an aneurysm. You know, you, and it's in your belly. No, I'd rather have TAVR. You know, it's really good because I read it. Everybody wants TAVR. Morbidity is really paravalvular leak and pacemakers, but those are getting smaller and smaller. That's an engineering issue and a, and a deployment issue. And the big question is durability. We don't know durability. And we're not going to know durability from the, from the extreme risk or the high risk because they're 83 years old. They're all going to be dead. Intermediate risk was, was designed as a five-year trial, but both sponsors are going to now carry it for 10 years and the low risk of 10-year trials. We will generate the best data we've ever had on both surgical and transcatheter durability from these trials with core lab echoes. Two low risk trials, both Partner 3 and, and, and Evolute, both of them are fully enrolled. Uh, I expect both these trials to be presented at ACC next year. Marty Leon will present Partner, I'll present the uh, Evolute trial. And I suspect strongly that both will be positive trials, non inferior, and we'll have a low risk randomization in the year 2019. Now, do we know anything about low risk? Well, yeah, there's a low risk randomized trial out there. It's called the Notion trial. It's the Nordic countries. And it was for patients 70 or above that were considered low risk uh, and, and randomized. It was set up as a superiority trial starting in 2009. This is before we were even using 3D measurement from, from uh, CTs to pick our valve sizes. So you could either look at this as a very bold trial or a crazy trial to be superior back then. Did they make superiority? No. For their all-cause mortality stroke or MI, which is their combined endpoint, it was non-inferior, it was the same, so it's, you know, it's, but not superior. If you break across all-cause mortality, the same. Stroke, the same. Myocardial infarction, the same. Now, they ran as a superiority trial. The question is, do you have to be superior if, if you, know, you have a less invasive thing? The answer is no. If you have a less invasive way of doing this and we can get good long-term results out of this, nobody's going to choose you getting operated on when I can do this and you can go home in two days and be normal at the end of the week. And they looked at the people with less than four, and again, no, no difference with SDS less than four. So a couple other caveats real quick. If I do heart surgery on you, your right ventricle falls out. That's the, 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 the line there. And your LV stroke volume falls out. So both these things happen because of the use of bypass. Neither one of those things happen with TAVR. So we know surgery hurts the heart. It's always going to hurt the heart. We just hurt the heart less than we help it. TAVR doesn't do the same thing. And the last uh, thing I want to show is these hemodynamics. I think I showed this yesterday. The one on the left is from Ramatula. That blue box is where most surgical valves sit, but at rest. And all our echoes are done at rest. But if you look at the other one, aortic flow on the up axis and gradient on the, on the horizontal axis, and the bottom red line is normal flow, 250 cc's a second across your valve. The upper red line is, is high flow as if you're exercising. So what do you see? You see you have to get to about an EOA of two before you can exercise without really increasing your gradient. So why, when, they do, when I do an aortic valve replacement, why don't these people live up to the normal population? Well, one reason is I leave them with some aortic stenosis. All stented valves have some aortic stenosis, whereas these have a whole lot less. And I think as we move into lower people, looking at hemodynamics becomes more and more important. We talked about this yesterday and why it's important to put in a big surgical valve, not only for good early hemodynamics, but for the possibility of valve and valve later if you're doing a bioprosthetic. Durability, we don't know, but we do know that we have five-year data showing there's no change in EOA or gradient in the partner one, the partner 1B, the partner 1A, the core valve extreme risk, the core valve high risk, which is now out to five years. I can't go over the data because it's going to be presented, but I'm going to guess it's going to look pretty good. Uh, the notion trial out to five years, and then we talked about this yesterday. The older you are, the slower these things to generate, the less time you are to, 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 la to live. But again, I think as we go in the, in the young, younger patients, we're going to still see improvements in the technique, and I think TAVR will allow a wider adoption of this. It takes, surgery is a technical thing. It takes 10,000 hours to be an expert. TAVR is technology. Technology is easier to learn than technique. And if durability is shown, pretty soon all lines will move all the way to the left, and TAVR will be a reasonable thing in anybody that's a candidate. Thank you very much.